said, my name is Ben Flower. I'm incredibly thankful for the opportunity to be meeting with you today and for the chance to share some of these soft skills topics. Um, I'm not going to give a lot of introduction right off the bat because I, I share a lot of I share a lot of stories in my presentations and through those stories you'll you'll get to know a lot about me. So I'm going to just jump into the content. Uh, of course, today we're talking about building your personal brand. Now, this is a topic that I've actually been presenting for many, many years. And if I could go back in time to when I was very first starting to develop this uh, and research this topic, there were a few things that really, really uh, stood out to me then and still stand out to me to this day. Um, and one of those things is with regards to the topic of branding in general. So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes talking about branding at the corporate level before we then turn the corner and start talking about branding at the personal level. So I'm going to just ask you for just a moment wherever you're at, whatever your environment is, just kind of take stock of that environment for a moment. And, and one of these kind of epiphanies that I've had uh, as I've created this presentation is to realize how much brands permeate our lives. Brands are literally everywhere we go with everything that we do. And just like I said a minute ago, if you take a moment to take stock of your environment right now, brands are everywhere from the watch that you're wearing to the cell phone you're using, to the computer you're using, to the snacks and beverages that you're consuming, to the clothes that you're wearing. Brands are everywhere. And so, you know, I, spending just a moment at the corporate level, I, I want you to think about that and I want to ask you a question. So I know this is going back in time about two years, but I want to ask you if you were to think, uh, or I should say guess, um, in the year 2019, which country in the world spent the most money on advertising in the year 2019 and and here's one of those points where i'm going to invite you to use your chat window go ahead i mean you can see on the slide some pinpoints in these various countries go ahead and type into the chat window which country you think spent the most on advertising in the year 2019 and I'm going to wait just a moment for a few people to, to chime in with what you think. The first person to chime in there looks like it was David who says China. I see Tanya, Jennifer, Doris all saying the United States. Uh, I will show you on your screen that the country that spent the most on advertising in 2019 was actually the United States. Um, but now I'm going to ask you a follow up question. And this one is a little more difficult. How much money did the United? How much money was spent on advertising in the United States in the year 2019? And I'm going to give you actually four options: one, two, three, or four. One is 50 billion. Two is 100 billion. Three is 150 billion. And four is 200 billion. So go ahead and type in your uh, chat window one, two, three, or four. How much do you think was spent on advertising in the United States in the year 2019? And I already see a number of responses. Most of them are four, a couple of threes. Um, go ahead and look at your screen, and you will now be able to see how much money was spent on advertising in each of those different countries um, in the year 2019. Now, I know we're living in a world right now with, uh, <laughs> well, from a from a financial standpoint with inflation and whatnot, these numbers kind of are sometimes difficult to interpret. But if you look at these numbers globally and add them all up, there was almost $800 billion spent globally in 2019. That's an obscene amount of money. And so the question is, why in the world would corporations be willing to spend so much money on advertising? And instead of asking you that question, I'm going to kind of answer it for you right now by just sharing with you a couple more comments before we move to personal branding. You know, if you look at your screen right now, you can identify, um, probably you can all identify the companies that own these four different logos right off the top of your head. Um, of course, we have Microsoft. McDonald's, Nike, and Starbucks. Well, the $800 billion that was spent on advertising in, 200, in 2019 goes beyond logos. It also goes to slogans. So one more exercise here to use your chat window. I'm gonna ask you to identify which is the company that has the slogan 
the happiest place on earth. Go ahead and type that into your chat window if you know what it is. I don't have prizes to give out, but I will call out the first person to answer that question correctly. So Jennifer wins that first question, correctly identifying Disney as the owner of the slogan, the happiest place on earth. Here's your second one. Finger licking good. Which company owns that slogan? All right, Helen was the first one to answer that correctly, and that is KFC. An interesting side note, in the last year, KFC has really had to sidestep their slogan because of the COVID virus. Um, not, not because it's a bad slogan, but because they don't want to encourage people putting their fingers in their mouths. Um, so I'm going to share two more with you, or just one more with you. Of course, just do it as Nike, but here's the last one I'm going to share with you, which is, there are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there is what? Well, who's the company that owns that last one? And David wins the, the contest for identifying the last one. So here's the point. Here's the last point I'm going to make before I move on to really focus on personal branding as opposed to corporate branding. One of the things that's really, really interesting to me as I go through these logos and these slogans is the epiphany here is that we have all come from very, very different paths in our lives that have brought us here today, uh, specific to where you were born, to where you were raised, to the schooling that you went to, to the careers that you've had. All of us have, have had these incredibly diverse paths that have led us all here today to this session on building your personal brand. And, and with all of those diverse paths, I'm able to show you a logo or a slogan. And for the most part, with all those diverse paths, we can still just rattle them off what the companies are. And so the question that I asked a minute ago, which was why would corporations be willing to spend $800 billion? It's because branding is powerful. Branding is powerful and important and they do it and you can see the results of why they do it. And so now what I want to start doing is asking if that branding element is so important and so critical in the corporate world, how much time, because of course we don't necessarily have monetary budgets, but how much time have you spent in building and managing and marketing your brand? <clears throat> so there's also another epiphany or theme that I'm going to share with you, which is to say, just share a quick definition of branding. And, and that epiphany is the fact that at the end of the day, it is not actually you that gets to decide what your brand is. It is the people that you interact with. From a corporate standpoint, it's the customer. From a personal standpoint, it's your boss, it's your peers, your customers. At the end of the day, you don't actually get to determine what your brand is. It is the people that you interact with. And so having said all that, I want to both ask and answer a question really quick, which is, you know, what is your current brand? You might not even know what your brand is, but I promise you that even if you don't know what your brand is, I promise you that you have a brand. And uh, we're going to spend some time talking here in the next uh, 45 or so minutes about how, if you don't know what your brand is, how you can figure out what your brand is. So um, there is a couple comments that I want to add as an additional point of definition. I talked a minute ago, just a moment ago, about how other people determine your brand. Um, it, it's these other people and their interactions with you that create these perceptions and emotions of how they deal with you and how they see you. Um, your brand is a reflection. It's a very, very clear reflection of who you are and, and the things that you believe. And fortunately, it's formed through other people's repeated contacts with you. Um, and then the most important point that I would make is that your brand is truly a reflection of your values. And we're going to talk about that in, in a little bit more detail here in just a couple of minutes. But before we go any further, I've talked about branding, what the, the definition of branding here, but I want to call out something that's incredibly important. And this is uh, the reason I call this out is because this is an area where a lot of people make an awful lot of mistakes. And that is when they confuse branding, legitimate, sincere branding with what I refer to as image building. Now, image building is completely different. Image building is basically when you create a facade and the the sad irony about creating a or trying to do image building is that 
most people think when they're doing image building that it's effective. But I'll give you a couple examples here in just a moment, and I can tell you very clearly that building a facade or doing an, doing image building as opposed to sincere branding, it's not effective at all. I mean, if I was you know working with you face to face right now and asked for a show of hands as to how many of you can identify somebody that does image building as opposed to sincere branding, I am confident that almost every hand would go up because we see image building so clearly. We see through it so clearly. And yet as humans, we latch on to this concept of image building and think that it's effective when it really isn't. So the quick example that I'm going to give you with that is with regards to a peer that I had uh, a few years ago. Um, I was a member of a team of a global team. Um, there were 12 to, to 14 of us on 14 of us on this team. One of my peers had a, a very visible habit of every time we had our weekly team meeting, they would be very disengaged. Um, they happened to work out of the same office as I did, so I got to observe this firsthand. But the rest of my team, even though they weren't in the same conference room as I was, they still had the same observation about this individual. And that is, every time we had our weekly team meeting, this individual was incredibly disengaged. They would have their head down into their laptop, doing emails, surfing the web, not paying attention until they heard their name come up or something that was important to them. And when that happened, they would perk up, they would all of a sudden interject themselves into the conversation, but they would almost always have to stop and do a rewind and ask for a, a quick update as to what is it we're talking about again, just so I'm, you know, I'm clear. And it was very evident and very frustrating. So there was a point in time where we all got a brand new boss. And when our when our brand new boss came on board, the, the first thing that they did is they invited us all to North Carolina to have a first team meeting where we could all be in the same conference room face to face. So we all traveled to North Carolina. We all were in the same conference room for the first time with a brand new boss. And about 30 minutes into that meeting, this peer of mine that I just told you about stood up and said, excuse me, but I would just like to make an observation. And that observation is that as we're sitting around this conference room table in this room, most of us have our heads in our laptops and we're not paying attention. And I just think that it's important that given that this is the first time that we have to spend with our brand new boss, that we, and also having spent as much money as we did to get here face to face, I would just like to recommend that we all close our laptops and give our undivided attention to our new boss. So my question to you, and I would invite you to use the chat window to answer this question, is if you were me in that situation and you just observed your peer stand up and make that comment, what would be your perception of that peer? What would be your brand that you would assign to that peer? And I'm going to wait for just a moment for a couple comments to come into the chat window to see if uh, to see if that story resonated and to see what your thoughts might be. Having heard that peer stand up and offer that comment, what would your brand be that you would assign to that individual? Fake, and I'm just reading what I see in the chat window right now. I see fake and deceptive. I do see human, and that's fine. There are definitely some, some attributes that you could uh, assign that wouldn't necessarily have a negative connotation, but I do see fake and I do see deceptive. A couple other people are typing. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make here is to say, uh, it's to reemphasize the point that it's not you that determines your brand, it's other people that determine your brand through their interactions with you. But it is also the point that I wanted to make about image building. One, one of the, the distinctions that I took away from that experience was that this individual was trying to employ an effort to build their image as opposed to marketing a brand that was sincere and legitimate and was based on their values. So I appreciate the comments that are in the chat window and they are accurate for the most part. Um, there were certainly things that I could or could not have done in that situation. It's funny that you say that because in one of the other soft skill sessions that we're doing in the coming weeks, I'll spend some time talking about how I responded to that situation and how you should respond to that type of a situation. But for the sake of this conversation, I just wanted to bring it up as an example of image building um, that hopefully resonates with everybody. Um, and again, in having done this as much as I as I have, 
one of the other things that I want to share with you really quickly is there are some categories here that I'm sharing with you on your screen, which are some of the biggest areas where there's a misalignment um, between what an individual actually what their brand is versus what they want it to be. And that's really what the, the point that I would make on this slide is you start thinking about your brand. One of the things that you need to clearly think about is what is your brand versus what do you want your brand to be? And I've spent a lot of time where there's certainly no ill will, there's certainly no uh, bad intentions, but a lot of times people will identify their brand as something that it's just not. And these are some of the most common areas where that occurs. I'll, I'll you know, routinely see people talking about how they're a team player, they're a very cooperative individual, when if you were to ask their peers, they would almost say the opposite. A lot of people say family first. Family is so important to me. It's the most important thing to me. And uh, just a really quick comment on that. I, having been in the, in the industry for as long as I have, in, in the tech industry and in a manager role for as long as I have, I would always say to others, and I'm going back to share hopefully an insightful story with you, that family was important to me as well. Well, one day um, in the midst of uh, working through a period of months where I was working really, really hard on long projects, I came home at the end of my work day and it was already dark and I walked into my daughter's room and I sat down on her bed just to say goodnight to her because she had already gotten into bed and as I was sitting there just having a small conversation with her before she fell asleep um, she said to me dad you're not like the other dads and at first I, I took a moment of pride at her comment because you're right I'm not like the other dads I'm, I must be cool or I must be this or that and she goes all the other all the other dads in in our cul-de-sac come home before it's dark and so that was kind of a wake up call for me as I continued to project my brand as being family first that I wasn't necessarily aligning what I was saying to my actions. And then the last comment there is expert in field. A lot of people tend to identify themselves as experts in their field um, when they've only been in their field for maybe one or two years. Um, true, a true expert in their field is somebody that has almost spent their entire career in a certain um, area of uh, study uh, or, or their their vocation. So let's go ahead and move on. Um, I want you just to pause for a moment and, and think about how other people see you. Um, and if people do not see you the way that you want to be seen, then it's usually one of two things. Either you haven't aligned your brand with your true values or you haven't spent enough time marketing your brand. And we're going to talk about how to market your brand here in just a few minutes. So again, thinking about how you're seen, do people see you the way you want to be seen? All right, so you know when you think about how you're seen, there's all sorts of adjectives that can be ascribed to who you are and what your brand is. If you think about the example that I just gave a moment ago about my peer, if I was to assign some words to their brand, I would probably say insincere, or I would say selfish even. Um, but I have plenty of great examples that I, we're, that I will share as well. Uh, and of course, this is just a small sampling of some of the adjectives that you might use to describe the brand of somebody that you work with or your boss or whoever it might be. So before we get into really talking about what you can do to understand and adjust and market your brand, I want to spend just like one or two minutes talking about why this is so important in the first place. And I'm assuming by the fact that you're joining the session today that you already have some personal viewpoints on why this is such an important topic. But I want to kind of add to that and tell you that in, in the many years that I've spent in my career managing direct reports and managing managers, I've seen so many examples of individuals that have a strong personal brand and those that don't have a strong, a strong personal brand. And I can tell you unequivocally, those individuals that have a strong defined brand and go about marketing their brand tactfully and effectively, they will see career advancement and growth opportunities and leadership opportunities at an incredible exponential rate than those that don't. Excuse me, I will also tell you, I'm um, just on another quick note, you know, does your name come up? Most corporations, most, most organizations that you work at, wherever you might be in your career, there's a process where there's an annual evaluation. And probably once a year, your boss goes into an environment where they present you to their boss and to their peers for purposes of maybe getting an annual pay increase or maybe getting a promotion. And I've sat through so many of those 
conversations where, for example, one of my peers or somebody will bring up somebody that reports to them and they'll say, this person is so fantastic. They've done this great work and they've done all this. And then after they're done presenting that individual, somebody else in the room will say, you know, that's really interesting because I've been in this organization for the last year too, this last year as well. And I don't think I've heard that individual say one word. I don't think I've ever heard them say anything. I've never heard them contribute to any conversation. I've never seen a project that they've managed. I've never seen an email that they've written. And so having no brand is almost as, almost as detrimental as having a bad brand. A um, couple other comments here about why this is such an important topic. I, uh, you know, over those years, those individuals reap much more financial um, rewards by having that strong brand. And then honestly, with, with regards to just their demeanor and their confidence and their job satisfaction, you know, those individuals that have a strong brand really have much more direction and job satisfaction and, and better job performance than those that don't. Um, when when I'm going through these topics in, and sharing these points of reference, um, sometimes I'll pause and I'll share stories, but I do want to comment, you know, I, I, I've gathered these observations um, over 25 years of managing direct reports and managing managers. And uh, we do have, I, I have other courses that I offer that are spread out across a four week window with four different workshops and homework and whatnot where we can dig in a little bit more. So as I, you know, in a, in a 60 minute session that I'm here sharing with you today, I don't have the time to dig into all the details on this, but I hope that you can hear the sincerity and the passion in my voice around these concepts of why this is so important. I have seen it play out time and time again over many, many years. So let's kind of turn the corner right now and start talking a little bit about how to go about understanding and changing and marketing your brand. And really the first point that I want to make is to do any of this, you have to go through a process of knowing what your brand is to begin with. And to do that, you have to know yourself. You have to take an inventory of your values. You have to really spend the time to figure out who you are and what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? What are your unique skills and, and how do you stand out from the crowd? Now, there's a lot of different uh, ways that you can do that. And I'll talk about how you can do that in just a minute. But I want you to spend a moment thinking about this advice with regards to taking an inventory taking an inventory of yourself and knowing who you are. What's interesting to me is when I talk about knowing your strengths and weaknesses and how you stand out from a crowd and what your, your, your unique skills are, what's interesting is sometimes it's so much easier to do that when you stop and do that at a corporate level instead of a personal level. So I'm going to do that for just a moment. You see on your screen the logos for two different car companies. Again, I'm going to direct you to the chat window and I'm going to ask you to type in Let's start with BMW. Please use the chat window and type in what are the the adjectives or the branding that you would associate with the um, car maker BMW. What are some of the words that you would use to describe that company? I'll wait for just a minute or two for some of you to type those words into the chat window. First comment that I see is high quality. Then I see high end luxury, speed. Any other thoughts as to the brand of BMW? I'm going to maybe wait for one or two more. Professional engineering. That's great. OK, well, I'll tell you what. And the last thing is longevity. Well, there's there's more I'm sure that will come through, but I'm going to have you now answer the same question, but for Kia instead of BMW. What, are, what is the branding and the adjectives that you would use to describe Kia as opposed to BMW? Some of you might not be familiar with Kia as an automobile manufacturer. Um, geographically, I'm not sure where they are and where they aren't sold, um, but I do see some comments coming into the chat window right now. I see affordable, useful, basic, will work. Any other comments about Kia? Maybe one more. I think it's interesting to note the, the useful, basic, and will work comment. That's awesome. Um, well, let, let me just say this. So the reason I was asking this question was because I was trying to take us down a path around identifying strengths and weaknesses, 
what are your unique skills and how you stand out from the crowd. Now that's relatively simple to do when you look at automobile manufacturers. Um, there is a distinction and a, and a very clear brand for both of these auto manufacturers. And I would quickly add that both brands are great brands. I mean, it just depends what you're looking for. There is um, there, there are people that love Kias for those reasons we, which we talked about, which are affordable and useful and basic and family oriented. And there's others that would like to pursue the BMWs of the world, which is prestigious and luxurious and powerful. Both are very clear brands. Both are very powerful brands and they're actually clear on how they stand out from the crowd. So now I want you to take that concept and start applying it to the personal level to think about you as an individual and how do you stand out from the crowd? What are your unique skills? And I don't know why, but sometimes it's much more difficult to do this. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. In, in in my career, I've had a lot of opportunities to do a lot of interviews, and a lot of those interviews have been where I was interviewing people that are pursuing a manager role or a people manager role, and they'd sit across the table from me, and I'd ask them, why should I hire you? What is it, what is it about you? Because I've got probably 20 different candidates that are seeking the same position that you are. What is it about you that should be the distinguishing factor or the reason why I should hire you? And so many times as I sat in that conversation, I would have the response come across the table as, well, I'm a people person. I really, really enjoy working with people. And, uh, you know, as far as working with people, I always have an open door. I'm very receptive to talking with my team. Um, that's why you should hire me. Well, I can promise you that almost everybody that's pursuing that role would say the same thing. There's nothing in that comment that would distinguish themselves or elevate themselves above the competition. So when you think about this and you think about your brand, a lot of this is about your value proposition. And a couple just real quick examples. I mean, maybe you're an incredibly analytical person. Maybe you know spreadsheets better than anybody and you can analyze and identify um, facts uh, at, at a level that far surpass, far surpasses the, the competition. Maybe you're incredibly creative. Maybe you're known for thinking out of the box and brainstorming and really being able to come up with great, strong, um, compelling ideas. Maybe you're a motivational speaker. Maybe you are um, inspirational speaker. Maybe you're really good at public presentations. Um, maybe you're uh, an, you know, an incredible programmer and, and you have some just unbelievable skills with regards to the certain um, programming code that you're a guru for. But the point is, as you start trying to think about your existing brand and the brand that you want to have, you have to understand who you are and what it is that sets you apart. So again, um, I appreciate the comment. I'm just noticing that there was a comment in the chat window that says those are canned responses. And indeed, the example that I gave, they were. So. When I have the opportunity to sit in front of somebody that I might be applying for a job or just having a conversation in general and I'm having an opportunity to introduce myself, I will share some things like this, that I am refined at leading change and change management. Uh, I'm really proficient at building business strategy and deploying that business strategy. Um, I have tons of competence and ability leading people and organizations, cross-group collaboration. I go to, my point is that I really take the time to distinguish what sets me apart from the competition. Now, as you go through this process yourself, there's lots of tools that you can use because I mentioned so many times already that it's other people that determine your brand. So when you're going through the process of knowing who you are and knowing what your brand is, you know, just ask people. I mean, there's there's great things like personality indicators. I'm sure most of you have heard like of Myers-Briggs or Strength Finder. There's 360 feedback tools. You can talk with your boss. But honestly, one of the best things or most easy things that you can do to figure out what your current brand is, is just ask. Ask your peers, ask people, ask family, ask friends. Make a deliberate effort to ask individuals that you know will be honest with you because that's the whole point of this exercise, but just ask and, and of course deploy those other tools as you see fit. So I mentioned a minute ago about how 
it's important to align your brand with your values because what we're leading to is you go through the process of understanding what your current brand is, getting all that feedback, and then you start to think about, well, what's my unique value proposition? You have this conversation now where you're trying to take that next step, which is what I refer to as building your brand promise. And I'll share with you a brand promise in just a moment. This is another thing that when you go through the full month long course, we'll spend a lot of time digging into and having you develop your brand promise and deliver your brand promise. But whatever that brand promise is, it really needs to be aligned with your values. So here's an example of my brand promise. I am a driven, articulate, fun leader who achieves exceptional results through refined people management, change management, and work ethic. That is my brand promise. And so when you think about your brand promise, that's really kind of where you're moving to as far as being able to say, this is who I am. Now, this actual brand promise is something that you could use, you could, in an interview type of scenario, um, but after you think about your brand and what you want your brand to be and you, you've created your brand promise, well, the next couple of steps are actually starting to market your brand. It's, it's incredibly important to go th through those steps that I just mentioned to make sure it's all your brand promise is aligned to who you really are. But after you've gone through that process, you need to start marketing your brand. And there's a number of ways that you can do this. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, you don't have to go back too many years before these tools didn't even exist. Um, the social media to tools that are at our disposal today are incredibly powerful and they can be detrimental if you're not careful, but they're, they're incredibly powerful in marketing your brand because after you've put in all this effort to understand, refine, develop, and build your brand promise, you need to go tell people what it is. The other, um, example that I would kind of point to is with regards to networking. In addition to the social media tools, networking is an incredibly important and powerful tool that you need to use as you are communicating your brand. And it's it's interesting, both with regards to the social media tools and also this topic of networking, there are courses that are dedicated to just those topics. So again, we're kind of kind of touching some high points along this 60 minute presentation, but I'm sure most of you have a social media presence today to some extent, and I'm sure that most of you understand conceptually the network that you've built. I'm calling out the incredible importance of those tools and that process of networking. You know, you can see on your screen here that referrals generate 80% more results than cold calls, that approximately 60% of all new jobs are found through networking and so on and so forth. But it's difficult to underestimate the power of effectively using social media tools and networking to communicate that brand that you've developed. And I'll kind of circle back to this question that I asked at the beginning of the conversation, which was, how are you seen? Do people see you the way that you want to be seen? And I'll come back to if that's not the case if people don't see you the way you want to be seen it almost always boils down to one of two situations one is you are not aligning your brand promise to your values or two you're not spending enough time marketing your brand and, and i didn't spend a lot of time on this but when i refer back to you're not aligning your brand promise to your values you know that just goes back to a little bit of potential be very very careful of looking at image building versus marketing as a, a sincere value-based brand um i mean if you think about it if you were to be watching television and all of a sudden you saw a commercial come on the television for kia and kia was saying that they are a very prestigious powerful luxury based automobile manufacturer there would be a misalignment with what they're saying they are versus what you see them to be. And the only reason I'm sharing this, I kid you not, um, I didn't, I, I, I literally yesterday was watching an advertisement for Kia because they're trying to move more and more into that powerful performance arena than their traditional budget conscious family friendly brand. 
and that in the commercial they were airing, they were actually doing speed and performance tests with the Kia um, pitted up against a BMW. And so you can change your brand. It's definitely something that you can go through the process of changing your brand, but it's a slow process and you have to be careful and you have to be deliberate and make sure that you're not image building, but that you are sincerely marketing a brand that is aligned to your values. And at this point in the presentation, if you're saying to yourself, man, he said that so many times, it's deliberate. I'm saying that so many times because it's so important and it's where I see the biggest mistake made because the mistake is people have this human nature to try to market the brand of what they aspire to and what they want to be as opposed to what they actually are. So do yourself a favor and don't kind of hamstring yourself by marketing the brand that you want to be as opposed to the brand that you actually are. Okay. Thank you for the comment, Tanya. Yes, authentic brand. So looking at the clock, we've got about 15 or 20 minutes left. I do want to spend some time talking, you know, kind of turning another corner and talking a little bit about branding um, and the efforts that you take to communicate your brand. You know, we talked about the social networking tools. We talked about networking. But honestly, one thing that's just also very compelling to me is to think about the ways people can damage their brands. Now. What you see on your screen is the corporate logo for some companies that basically no longer exist. And so when I talk about protecting your brand, um, there's things that these companies did from as far as a misstep that led to their basic dissolvement. Um, but there's a couple things that I then want to correlate to what you do as you communicate your brand, whether it's through social networking or networking or whatever. And you know, the comment here is that a reputation that took decades to build can be threatened by a single event. It's very, very easy to look around the world today, especially with regards to politicians or sports, uh, professional sports athletes. And you've seen many, many examples in the news where indeed somebody that has taken years and years to build a strong reputation um, ends up almost destroying that overnight. But here's the point. When, when I talked at the beginning of the session about corporations and how much money they spend, you know, almost $800 billion in 2019, but well, we don't have those budgets, but we do have the ability to communicate. And so this is your primary vehicle, whether it's social media or just talking with people through email or on the phone. This is how you communicate. This is how you tell people what your brand is. And so I want to spend just a moment giving some pretty strong advice and recommendations on things that you can do to protect your brand. And this will come across to you as things not to do, but I also want to kind of spin that um, and look at things to do because there's two sides to that coin. So let me first of all give you an example. Um, as far as the world that we live in right now with COVID and working from home becoming so much more common, there is a big shift to some of these communication methods as opposed to the face-to-face -face conversations that we used to have. One of those is through email. So I'm going to give you a quick example. Um, many, many years ago, I had an individual that didn't report to me directly, but they reported to a manager that reported to me. And this individual was probably the most technically competent person I had ever met. They were incredibly smart, wizard smart with regards to their technical aptitude, but their communication was very, very harsh, very brash, very caustic, very arrogant. And it seemed like everywhere they went, they were hurting people's feelings and making people upset. And I remember very clearly at the time having a number of those annual review conversations about how to evaluate this individual. Um, because despite the fantastic technical aptitude, they just had this wake of destruction that they left wherever they went. And so um, I left the organization and I ended up not eventually having to deal directly with that individual, but it was about a year later after I left that organization when I, when this email came across my desk. I'm not going to read the whole email, but it was from that individual and they basically said, I'm heading out. I've had enough. This is not a good job anymore. Um, in the many years of business, I have never been in such a dysfunctional group. I'm not going to waste any more time. This company needs to go through an overhaul, top to bottom. And, and it was when I read this email, it was like, yep, that's that same individual. They haven't changed a bit. They still have this caustic, brash way of communicating. 
And so since I was no longer in that organization anymore, I just kind of filed it away or deleted it and didn't have to worry about it. Um, that email was sent to me in September. I got another email from that individual in February of the following year. So just a few months later, that, e that individual reached out to me and said, hey, Ben, hope all is well with you and the family. I'm just pinging you to see if you had any openings in your organization. So let me ask you again through using the chat window, if you were me and receiving this follow up conversation, uh, email communication from that individual, would you consider hiring them or bringing them into your organization? You just type a quick response into the chat window there. Uh, and I do see the uh, heck no, no, and no. And, uh, and if I let this keep going, the answer is no. And that was definitely how I felt. No way. Absolutely not. Great, smart individual, but just too much uh, of a concern with their email communication. So here's the deal. Here's the strong recommendation, because I know that if you haven't already experienced this in your life, in your career or wherever you might be sending email, you will. This will come to you. And it's basically when you're upset. If you have a situation where you're irritated or angry or upset with a peer or whoever, most of us have sat down at that keyboard and just typed out a really aggressive, angry email because it feels good to vent to an extent. But my advice, and this is really strong advice, is if you find yourself in a situation where you're writing an email when you're frustrated, go ahead and write it, go ahead and finish it, but park it for 24 hours. Do not send it until you come back 24 hours later and read it again, because I promise you that you will probably see some of that edginess and anger that should not be sent in that email. It's just, it's so strange how that works. And I've honestly, in all my years where I've sent emails like that, it so rarely accomplishes what you want it to accomplish by sending that flame mail and being angry. It also communicates a really, really strong brand, which you want to avoid. So that's why I bring it up um, and just want to encourage you to take that approach to park it for 24 hours before you then reread it and consider either sending it or not sending it after you've had a chance to cool down. OK, so let me share a couple more concepts with you. Um, if you look at your screen, I'm sharing some pictures um, and I'm going to ask you just to again use the chat window. Anybody want to take a guess as to where I found all of these pictures? I'll give you just a moment to think about that and, and um, type into the chat window where you think I might have found the pictures that you see on your screen. I see potential employees. I see Facebook. Good guesses, not accurate yet. Maybe one more guess, Google, Facebook, Twitter, no. Those are all good guesses. But I will tell you, most email programs have an ability to assign an avatar to your email address. Now, normally what you would see or would want to see is a professional portrait of you, um, but People are creative. People use the ability to uh, sign an avatar to their email. And I just grabbed these off of my email server from people that I just went to the global address book and I was just looking for avatars that people use with their name. So when I'm talking to you about how, to, how you communicate online and protecting your brand, there's, for the record, nothing necessarily wrong with this, but everything you do communicates part of your brand. And for example, you know, if you're the individual that assigned or attached the picture of a person asleep in a hammock, that communicates a brand to somebody that would open up that email and see that picture. Um, again, I, I, I'm going to share this with you again in just a moment. There's nothing inherently wrong with putting avatars on your email like this, but there is a consequence and some people um, you you will suffer a consequence from doing that. It definitely has an impact to your brand. And we'll talk about that more in just one minute. Now, there's some other pictures that you're now looking at on your screen, and I will ask you the same question. Where did I get these pictures from? Um, you can use your chat window to answer that question. To, to be honest with you, though, most of you have, or a, a number of you have already identified where I found these pictures. These are all just random pictures that I grabbed off Facebook and it's could it could be Google. It could be Instagram. It could be anything, but people have kind of just this, you know, 
personality and the apps are fun and there's you know all sorts of reasons why these would be fun pictures to post and i'm not saying that these are bad people but it is definitely communicating a brand and i'll make this point now and i'm going to make it again in about five minutes it is absolutely not fair that somebody would judge you from the avatar that you assign to your email or to the pictures that you put on Facebook or the way that you appear or what, whatever, it's absolutely not fair. But this isn't a conversation about what's fair and what's not fair. This is just a conversation where I'm sharing with you very sincerely with years and years of experience with tons of stories that I could share that if you're not careful, you can unintentionally damage your brand. And this is one of the biggest ways that you can do it. And I'm sure you've all heard the stories before about people that have posted pictures on Facebook, which have come back to haunt them after the fact. So let me move on and share just a few more thoughts about protecting your brand. Um, it's interesting. We, we all talk on, th on the phone quite a bit these days. Um, I'm sure the most of you have had the option, uh, have had the opportunity to talk with somebody on the phone who really isn't 100 percent dialed into that conversation. They're distracted. There's background noise and you can definitely hear it. That communicates part of your brand. And even though we don't do it as much anymore, there is definitely, you know, even face to face the opportunity to convey that message. I'm, I'm assuming that most of you have probably had an experience where maybe you're meeting with your boss and you're in a one on one meeting with your boss and your boss is multitasking or they're looking at their computer or they're looking at your phone and they're not focused on you. That really is damaging to their brand as your boss. So I'm going to we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to show a quick video clip which highlights this point and it highlights it quite specifically based on the environment that we are now working in. And that environment is a remote environment, a working from home environment. So this is just a fun uh, video clip. Give me about 10 seconds to tee it up. And uh, I just need to switch screens here so you're not seeing my PowerPoint. Give me one moment to switch to this screen instead. Okay, you should start seeing that now. Hey Paul, thanks for being here on time. Paul? Hey Paul, can you hear me? I can't hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hey guys. Hey Tyler. Sorry I'm late, I'm having a hard time connecting. One second, Paul's having a sound issue. I can't hear you. Try adjusting your output settings. Can you it's hear the, me? It's the gear icon. Tyler, are you on hotel Wi-Fi? Yeah, why? Uh, never mind. I got it. I just had to change a few settings. Great, great. Uh, uh, maybe we can get maybe started. We can get started then. Then. Oh, great, oh, great. Uh, I think your uh, mic is mic is pushing up your speakers. My mic. Hey, Beth. Hey, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. I had to download a new version of the platform. You should plan extra time for the updates. There's pretty much one every time. Sounds like someone just joined. Hey guys, it's John. Um, I had to call in. I'm stuck in traffic. Have I missed anything yet? Uh, no, it would have been nice for you to join the rest of us, but uh, we'll just we'll see you when you get home. All right, while everyone is here, finally, uh, Tyler, do you have that financial report? Well, it's been the last few weeks updating our books, and I got some great news for you. Schedule from this point last year. We had a great Q1. We lost Tyler, I think. Am I frozen? Hey, Trip, I think we lost Tyler. Yeah, I know. I know we lost Tyler. Hey, guys, it sounded like Tyler was cutting out. We know, John. All right, while we wait on Tyler, why don't we go over the, Why don't we go over all of the reports? From the, Beth, are you with us? Oh, yeah. Okay, everyone, I know some of you have to leave soon, but I just wanted to go over a couple of the queries before. Oh, okay, okay, excuse me. Um, my wife's out of town this week. Daddy's, I'm so sorry. Okay, you just spilt grape juice on the carpet. Daddy is in a meeting. Okay, give me one moment to switch back to my PowerPoint. And you should be able to see that again. So I'm 
almost positive that in the last year you have all experienced, whether yourself or through peers or through a boss, something similar to that video clip that we just watched. And, you know, the topic that we're talking about right now is building your brand. Oops, give me one second. I think my PowerPoint just went away. There we go. Um, part of how you show up in this new virtual world speaks volumes about your brand. Um, and it's it's easy to actually, you know, relate to a lot of those circumstances. Sometimes they're outside of our control and that's understandable. I'm not suggesting that if you have one misstep that that's going to irreparably damage your brand, but you need to be aware of how you show up, especially in this new virtual world with when so much of what we do is online. I you know, even before the last year, a, a few years ago, I worked on that same global team and every Monday morning we'd have a meeting, a team meeting. And the timing of that meeting, since we were spread across the United States, I was always joining that meeting at about 730 in the morning, my time, which was when I was always driving to work. And I remember having a one on one with my boss just a little bit after I had um, started this new 7.30 a.m. commute and attending the phone calls, the team meetings on my phone, where they said, Ben, what's going on? Every single time we have our team meeting and you try to talk, all we can hear is this static and background noise. You know, it's it, it's really distracting and frustrating. You got to stop doing that. And so just spend some time to ask yourself the environment that you're attending these virtual meetings from. Make sure that you have a dedicated, quiet environment free of distractions and that you're focused. And, and here's the other thing. I really, really, from a branding standpoint, recommend that you turn your video camera on. You know, obviously there will be days or times where you can't, but when you have the opportunity, turn your video camera on because that really is powerful in projecting your brand. Now, the last thing I'm gonna share with you here before we wrap up is just a quick comment about appearance because as you turn that camera on, Obviously, you can't join those meetings in your pajamas. Um, maybe occasionally you can, but the image that you're conveying is the image of your brand. And we're gonna talk a lot about this in one of the next workshops that I actually do, which is focused on think and talk like a leader, but the appearance that you have is definitely part of your brand and it's incredibly important. There are, um, a lot of different opinions on this topic. And I'm gonna very quickly circle back to a comment that I made just a few minutes ago, which is to say that it is not fair that somebody would judge your brand by your appearance. But this has nothing to do with being fair. I promise you that your appearance has an impact on your brand. Again, we'll talk about this more in one of the other human skills sessions that I present through the Microsoft Reactors program. But the good news is when we talk about your appearance, it's not like you have to go spend a ton of money on a new wardrobe or spend a ton of money on, you know, whatever it might be, jewelry or, you know, whatever. Um, the, the good news is that really when it comes to your appearance, it's just about putting in an effort with regards to the way that you show up. Did you put an effort into the way that you showed up? Did you comb your hair? Did you put on a clean shirt? Are you there with a strong internet connection and alert and dialed into the conversation taking place? Now, the last comment that I'm gonna share before I hand this back over to James just has to do with some really strong advice as you go about your process of seeking out what your brand currently is, talking with other people, getting their feedback. And that comment has to do with accepting feedback. It's human nature that when people give us negative feedback or constructive criticism, that we tend to kind of cringe or take offense to that to an extent. Um, the point is, is that feedback is a gift. And especially if you're out there seeking for that feedback so that you can understand your brand, you have to be very, very welcoming and accommodating to that feedback that people are giving you. And again, it's it's not human nature to do that, but you have to build up that ability to just accept it and be so thankful for the feedback. A number of years ago, um, I had a direct report of mine who they were an individual that talked and talked and talked. And I got to the point where after a couple months of having one-on-ones with them and they'd come into the meeting with me 
and they would spend 55 minutes out of the one hour that we had talking, I finally got to the point where I had to sit them down and say, look, you need to spend more time listening to me so that I can give you feedback and that I can help you in, in, in your career. They were really kind of frustrated with that feedback, came back to me a couple weeks later and said, so Ben, I have some feedback for you. And I said, great, what is that feedback? And they said, you know, um, you have this hol holster on your belt that you put your cell phone in and you always have your cell phone in this holster on your belt. And Ben, that's really just not cool. I mean, nobody does that except you. And I'm just letting you know that you might wanna not do that anymore. And that human nature kicked in and it was like, whoa, what? I, I didn't even think about it, but I went home and I, I listened to their feedback. I went home, I asked my wife what she thought, and she said, yeah, they're probably pretty accurate with that comment. And then I asked my kids what they thought about the cell phone holster that I had, and they just laughed. They just laughed and laughed because they thought it was so funny. Of course, they agreed with the feedback that I had been given. But the point is, you have to be receptive to that feedback, willing to hear it, and then don't take offense, be willing to, to make adjustments as necessary. And honestly, in the corporate world or in your career, also part of your brand is your results. So I'm going to encourage you to take the information we talked about today to heart. I promise you, I absolutely promise you that if you spend some time focusing on this topic, it will pay dividends. I've seen it many, many times and I encourage you to do it. And I'm gonna wrap it up here by saying, thank you so much for the opportunity to meet with you today, share this with you, and I'm gonna turn it back over to James. Thank you, James. Thank you so much, Ben. That was awesome. I'm very conscious of my unbrushed hair now, but uh, we will leave it there. Um, so that was awesome. Thank you everyone for joining and particularly thank you for participating. It was great to see all of the comments in the chat section. So. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, a quick one, let me see if I can find the slide. So I think you, most of you should have already uh, know where to find us, but um, you can see there hopefully um, some different kind of links where you can find us. So while we've got our Reactor Meetup group, we're on Twitter. Um, all of our content is available on demand on our YouTube channel. And we also have a regular email that we you can sign up to as well, which is uh, cut by kind of uh, geographical region. So uh, all of those links are there. Um, but thank you again, Ben. That was awesome. And we will be here at the same time next week. So thanks, everyone. See you again. Thank you.